Good morning and welcome on the Sunrise Safari. My name is Brent. I have Andrew on camera. Uh, we have James and Jandre on the other vehicle and we have Viam and Tara in final control. So what a wonderful day to start the morning on safari. Um, at the moment we are trying to track. We heard some hyena whoops earlier. So they were, it sounded like they were in this general direction. So we're going to try to see if we can find those hyena. Um, for those of you who are new, welcome. Um, you're on a live African safari. Thanks for joining me on the back of my vehicle. For our regular viewers, always great to have you with us. So we had such an exciting sunset safari last night. Um, we tracked Karula on and off for two days and finally managed to find her on a bushbuck kill in a tree right outside Vuyatela Lodge. And we sat there and waited. And we actually were trying to get James to come in to meet Karula for the first time. And about five minutes before he arrived, this sudden shuffle in the grass right next to me, less than a meter from me, I suddenly saw a big male leopard. And we managed to get there, and he jumped up the tree, chased Karula. Karula actually jumped over him and then went down the tree and disappeared. So really, really exciting stuff. And that big male leopard turned out to be Mvula. So a really, really exciting sunset safari. And for me, after watching some of the highlights afterwards, um, watching James' dust bath was also quite priceless. Um, but welcome on this sunrise safari. And we're going to go check around this area. I know James is going to go see if we can follow up on um, some of those leopards. And thank you for all the Zoomy updates um, about the leopards at um, 4 o'clock this morning and the lions calling at 5. I'm going to try to check that general direction. I was up. I heard where the lions were. And James is going to try to follow up on those leopards. Hopefully he gets to meet Karula for the first time. That would be really exciting for him. So in the meantime, we're going to continue on. And also, sorry, there was a lion audio and um, animal alarm calls around 1 o'clock at Arethusa. So if we get no luck in this area, I might take a meander down there and see what's going on. So Zoomies and everyone who watches the, the dam cams, thank you very much. Uh, we really do appreciate it. It does make our job a little bit easier when we wake up in the morning. But in the meantime, let's go see what we can find on this sunrise safari. Quite a chilly this morning. Uh, 10 degrees Celsius, which is 50. Do you remember, Andrew? 50? 59, 49, sorry, 49, 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, my mathematics is absolutely horrific. Uh, at least I don't have to do much maths uh, in my job. Uh, I just have to look for leopards and lions and other wonderful things in the bush. And uh, we're going to probably put ourselves in a slightly colder position now um, than it is because we're going to drop down into a drainage line. So I'm quite sure the temperature is a degree or two colder down here. Sandy in Indiana. Uh, the would like Sandy and Anna would like to know what the largest flying bird is in South Africa. Uh, I was hoping those hyenas were going to be around in Africa. Um, I know which is the heaviest flying bird, uh, and that is a Cory Bustard. And we're just going to sit here and listen, and I'll get a picture of that large avian for you, Sandy. So that is the heaviest flying bird, is a Cory Bustard. Um, I think probably the largest, even though it's not the heaviest, um, is one of the casked hornbills from the... Oh, uh, or the ground hornbill, actually. But um, it is physically bigger uh, than... It's physically bigger than uh, 
a, a, a sort of Cory Buston or looks bigger, the ground hornbills, but they are, are not heavier. Um, so a Cory Buston is the heaviest flying bird in Africa and in South Africa. They prefer slightly more arid country than we are in now, although they do occasionally pop up unannounced in these areas. There we go. I'm not quite sure of the wingspan. They are very big but very heavier, but heavy birds. A Cory Busted. And they prefer semi arid savanna and grassland, um, whereas we are sort of in between. And we don't have that much grass in that area, so that's why we don't see too many of them. There you go, Sandy. Um, I hope that helps. And we're going to continue on. It doesn't look like the hyenas, they could still be quite close to here. But they aren't right here at the moment. I don't know how I manage to tangle cables so easily all the time. There we go. Untangled. It's a special skill, I think. It's like not being able to keep my clothes clean for longer than about seven minutes before I find some manner of dust or dirt on myself. <coughs> Obviously not quite as dirty as James after his dust bath, um, but on a normal day, uh, I definitely end up more dirty than James in a short time. Hi Lynn, welcome on this wonderful sunset safari, uh, sunrise safari, sorry about that. Um, and Lynn would like to know if I saw the leopard tracks on the Juma Dam Wall as I crossed it this morning. Well, I think we'd have to ask James. Uh, James is the one who went across uh, the Dam Wall looking for leopard tracks this morning. I was just, I was trying to follow up on the hyenas that were whooping. Um, but unfortunately, no luck. So, you're going to have to ask James when we cross to him. Hey, Andrew, are you ready for the coldest part of our morning? Mm. We are going to drop down into the depths of the drainage line, and I'm sure we're going to drop a degree or two at the same time. So I think I need to get my mitts ready. One must fail for the poor cameraman. They cannot wear gloves to operate the camera. So they have very cold hands on these early mornings. And you can definitely feel the temperature drop as we get to the bottom of these drainage lines in the early morning. Just checking tracks very carefully um, at the moment. At the first hour <clears throat> of uh, the game drive is very important um, to check tracks very carefully because there's a possibility those tracks could have been made in the in the last couple of minutes. So it's the time when the big cats are moving. from Los Angeles. Uh, Jean says, did I get a feel from Vula's eye last night? It looks like it's healing and it certainly didn't stop him 
speeding up that African ebony last night. It did look a lot better to me, Gene. Um, let me just give me a split second here. And I will actually had a look and it looked much, much better. I think I managed to get a photograph of it. Give me, there we go, that look. Nope. There still does look to be a little bit of damage, but it is looking much better. So there we go. Oh. You can see a lot of the swelling's gone down, even though there is still a bit of damage. It is looking much, much better. And, yeah, it didn't seem to hamper him at all. And he was looking in very good condition. Um, so, hopefully, he continues uh, to reign over these areas. Some interesting facts that came out of that um, leopard meeting that James and I went to yesterday. Mvula... Uh, has the largest territory of any male leopard, uh, known male leopard in the Sabi sands. Um, nearly double some of the other leopards. So, very interesting. What was that? Was that a track? It was a track of Howard the Hyena. So while we continue up to the north and west where I heard that lion audio uh, earlier this morning, uh, we're going to cross across to James and see how his leopard tracking endeavors are going. And we'll be back with you a little later in the show. Good morning everybody, good morning here, you find us on a Jiga, it's about minus 350 degrees Celsius, minus 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, um, I am trussed up like a Michelin man, and behind me, uh, Jean Dre is trussed up, what are you trussed up like, he's got a various strange things on that makes him warm. These cameramen have a very strange fashion sense, especially for the bush. Anyway, regardless, welcome. It is yet another magnificent African morning. The sun is just peeping over the horizon and we are trying to find some leopards. For those who don't know me, my name is James and if you're a new viewer, you're especially welcome. Not that any of our faithful viewers are not even as especially welcome. Please remember, we love to hear from you. Questions, comments, anything you'd like to say, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. Now, I must thank the Zoomies and those who've been watching the damn cams um, over the course of the evening. Apparently, a leopard did cross the wall at Juma Dam at 4.30 and then headed off in a northwesterly direction. Brent is currently in that area. I did check around the dam and the kill site and some of the roads around that area and didn't come up with any tracks. And I've come south just to make sure um, that uh, we don't pick up some sort of tracks. Um, I suspect that male and female would have gone in a separate direction, and I'm desperately hoping to meet Karula for the first time today. Whether that will happen or not remains to be seen. So we're just going to head down towards the water here, and then back up towards that um, area where the leopard was seen at 4.30 this morning, and see if we can't find some tracks on the way. There's an extensive drainage line system that runs down from the dam um, from Jum uh, Juma Dam to Twin Dams over here. And that would be the most obvious place for a leopard to be, uh, but they often don't do exactly what we think they are going to. All right. So, without further ado, 
I think that we will press on towards Twin Dams, and then we'll turn round and make our way gently north to see what we can find that way. You are most welcome. So far, we have seen one hyena who was snuffling about at the kill site, and I suspect he had, uh, had picked up the odd bone that fell from the hapless bush, but um, lamb that was pulled up into the tree. But uh, no leopard that we could see. I'd be very interested to know if the leopard that crossed the dam wall looked like um, Bula, big male. Uh, Karula, the female who made the film. For those of you who are perhaps new, um, Karula is the sort of, uh, she's been dubbed the Queen of Juma, so the sort of star of our show. Uh, I have yet to see her, I've only been here four weeks, or uh, well, just over four weeks. And she is, she's a female leopard, she's getting on in age now, uh, but very exciting to have seen her last night, and Mvula is a sort of, t sort of territorial male at the moment, um, and they had a scuffle last night. I'm just going to talk to Brent on the radio quickly. Go ahead. Probably thank you. So, that's interesting from Brent. Um, he has found that there are no tracks of the leopards on Mbubu Road, which is the road that is parallel to the drainage line that goes north from, from Juma Dam. So, where they have gone, I'm not sure. As a friend of mine once said, uh, he, he had, a, was a, had a very strong Afrikaans accent, a wonderful fellow called Kovas, and Kovas said to me, James, you know, the thing with a leopard is it can fly, but no one knows it can fly. And the point of that being that when they've been in an area, they can literally just disappear. Plenty of hyena tracks all over the road, just like there are every morning. from Chris on Twitter. Thanks, Chris. You said you think it was a hyena tracks all over the road, morning. just like there are every morning. Really interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, they're both in their core territory at the moment, so there really will be quite a lot of overlap. Although Mvula should, in theory, be a lot bigger. Mvula has been, though, for the last little while is very interesting. She apparently has one of the biggest female territories um, in the history of the Sabi Sands. And there's been a huge amount of research on the leopards in this area. Over 500 life histories have been ga gathered on the leopards of the Sabi Sands. And of those, she has the second largest territory of any other leopard. Piece this stop. I'm troublesome. But as yet, I've got no tracks. Hello, Lisa. What a lovely question. Um, while we try and warm ourselves on this chilly morning, you apparently have been viewing for a month, so about as long as I've been doing this job. Not that it's a real job. Um, you want to know, why do we not see more vultures at kill sites? Lisa, so if we take yesterday as an example, the, that vulture or that kill was in a very uh, deeply covered tree and so almost invisible from the air. So that's one of the reasons you wouldn't have seen a vulture. Vulture, uh, vultures out here 
use their sense of sight mainly to find pills. They don't use smell. So if the um, if the uh, kill happens to be covered by foliage like that, then it's highly unlikely that they will be able to see the kill to come down to try and take them. Um, so if they could have seen it, say it was out in the open, which is a, a thought experiment because it wouldn't have been out in the open with a leopard. Um, then they would have seen it come down, landed in a, a dead tree or two, um, uh, and they'd have sat around until the leopard had left. Uh, but what's interesting is that because she killed it, we think she killed probably um, late yesterday afternoon, especially in winter time, Lisa. What happens is the vultures lose the ability to fly easily when it gets cold. And so they would land, you know, as soon as the heat of the day starts to ebb at around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the vultures will land in the trees. And so they won't even be up looking for kills. stop here and we're going to have a listen. We're going to stop and have a quick listen here and see what we can hear. Oh yeah, I parked you in a ridiculous position. I'm just going to go a little bit forward. So we're at Twin Dams now, which is quite near the southern boundary of our reserve. Um, and Lisa, just to follow on from that lovely vulture question, uh, vultures in general, we do find a lot around here, um, but they will, you know, we don't see them hugely often. They spend a lot of time flying all over the place, um, but they are around. Right. Okay. Not much to be heard around this part of the world, which is a bit sad. And Brent has found some tracks of a male lion, uh, but no leopard tracks, which is very interesting. So why not, what are we going to do is we're going to just head off um, back up towards Gari Dam, but then head further to east, to the east, to where the, you can see the rising sun coming up. That's a really lovely little sight to see. And we'll head off that way and see if we can't pick the tracks up. Perhaps crossing this extensive drainage system goes between the two dams. Right, Jean Dre. We will now do an about turn. I find myself stretching quite a lot at the pedals today because the seat won't go forward after Brent Leo Smith's extensive frame has uh, filled it. Hello, Jim in Washington. Um, lovely question about fire, and you say that you're about to start your wildfire season where you are now, um, and you want to know, is fire a problem here? Jim, it can be a problem. Um, our fire season sort of starts next month-ish, because that's when everything's dry enough to burn. Um, but I don't think it's a problem in the same way that uh, you chaps probably find it. I suspect, um, if I think of the, the sort of latitude of Washington State, which I think is where you are, um, you probably, your bushfires are probably not um, so much fires that would happen in, 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 a, in terrain like this. It's probably in trees, if I'm not mis in, incorrect possibly plantations, and those fires tend to be a lot more dangerous than fires we get through here. We do often get fires through an area like this, but the stuff that burns here is the grass. So the grass is the major fuel load of fires here, and if there isn't a lot of grass to burn, especially after a year of poor rain like we've just had, then yes, we, we, we do cut fire breaks around the lodges and the buildings, 
Um, but if fires start, they generally burn out fairly harmlessly. After years of very big rain, when the grass is high and the fuel load is big, then fires can sweep through the area and they can certainly be very dangerous, yeah. And certainly in the Cape, uh, around the Western Cape, fires in the Fainbos, uh, came th uh, we had terrible fire season this year and they threatened a lot of hope. Lisa, back on the vultures, do you want to know if they mate for life? Do they mate for life? I suspect probably, I don't think it's as, probably as defined as they mate for life. They certainly pair up in, I think, fairly long-term bonds. But whether those bonds change or not during the course of their lives, I'm not sure. Uh, but they do form long-term bonds, especially the white-backed vultures. Uh, which are the ones we get, major ones we get around here, you know, the most common ones, and they nest in little tree tree nests, which they repeatedly use. So yes, I mean, for a large portion of their breeding lives, they will be in, in pairs. So we're driving quite close to the drainage line and the air is not warming up at a great speed. Jean Ray is uh, rubbing his hands together and gone blue. in ocean shores of Washington. Lots of lots going on in Washington State today, obviously. Um, very, very nice and very clever question. How do we know the size of leopard territories? Do we get the information from other reserves, from other um, uh, lodges? Absolutely, Judy. Uh, we went to a wonderful talk, Brent and I, yesterday by a, a doctor of um, uh, science, and he, he's done a lot of leopard research. What he did, uh, what they do is, is he, he correlates data from uh, all the sightings that, that the lodges around here have. So ones that we have, and we'll phone him up and tell him, well, this is all. Take a GPS point, there's a giraffe. Hiding, lurking in the bush. Cheeky little number. See it there, genre. We'll just stop here, Judy, and answer your question, and we'll just have a quick look and see if we can't, if that giraffe doesn't pop out. I'm sure we drove past him on the way past here. So, Judy, what they do is they collate the sighting. So, say we see Karula, like we did yesterday. We'll take a GPS point, send it through to them. And over the course of time, yeah, and through the different sightings plots, you can tell exactly how uh, the pattern of the leopard territories. Good request from Brent. Stand by. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, John Ray, I'm not sure how we can get a better look at him or her just now. But let's let's wait here and see if she doesn't come out. I don't know what she's eating. See how beautifully camouflaged. I think it's probably a she. Eating again, same we saw a giraffe last night eating zizifus, which is buffalo thorn tremendously thorny bush although that individual looks a bit darker than the one we saw yesterday so possibly a male the males are generally darker but not necessarily so I'm very sure that it was eating in the very same bush as we drove past a bit earlier now, if a giraffe finds it that easy to hide, can you imagine how easy a leopard finds it to hide? Beautiful sounds of the morning. You can hear a hornbill twittering off to one side. I think that's 
it's a puffback shrike calling behind the giraffe, but I'm not sure. That could have sort of... I don't know what that is. Might even be a drongo doing some sort of um, some sort of impression of another bird. There we go. That is a bull. It's a beautiful big giraffe bull. Oh, isn't he magnificent? No, I'm. No, it is a bull, is it? Yes, it is a bull. I'm not going mad. Goodness for that. I'm going to sneak forward, jean and see if we can't get a better view of him. Quite nice if we can get the drongo he's with. Uh, I don't think we're going to get a little through here. I'll just sneak off road and see if we can't get a look. a great view. He might come out. It is a forktail drongo. That very sort of um, strident whistling call that you can hear is a bird called a forktail drongo. And they attend herbivores quite a lot. They don't, um, they sort of follow them very closely because they kick up bits of uh, invertebrates and those sorts of things. They disturb them in the trees and in the grass and then the drongos hawk down and catch them. Not a great view of a giraffe. And he's watching us very carefully. They're very inquisitive. And he's just enjoying the first rays of the sun as they catch him, catch his white ears. That's a 1.4 ton animal, almost co rendered completely invisible by his coloration and by the bushes he's standing behind. He obviously doesn't really want to be seen, so I think we'll probably leave him and uh, carry on. So, very interesting comment from Anna Marie. Um, you say you're astonished that the, uh, the thorns don't hurt the tongue of the giraffe, and I find it amazing every time I watch them. As far as I understand, what happens is, um, I mean, you imagine the tongue would be quite hard. But if, if you find a dead giraffe and you feel the tongue, it's, it's not leathery, it's quite soft. So what I think happens is they produce a huge amount of saliva, first of all, which lubricates the tongue a lot. And then I think the dermal layer probably sloughs off and re re replaces itself uh, frequently. So I think that's how they manage to do it. But it is incredible to watch, especially, I mean... The, the buffalo thorn's pretty vicious, but the knob thorn is even more vicious. And they, they will wrap, I mean, the, the thorns of a knob thorn are sort of two, two double hooks that uh, stretch the length of a branch. And a, and a giraffe will wrap its tongue around those thorns and just pull opposite to them. So, I mean, they must be digging into the flesh. It's impossible that they couldn't be. It doesn't make any difference. It's really ast astonishing. You know, he's not being particularly confiding, so I think we'll leave him where he is and uh, press on. Hello, Leslie in California. Um, you're talking about giraffe social structure and apparently and they and how you want to know how big their herds can get uh, i just want to make sure that i didn't leave you with the wrong impression they are social the females but loosely so so they don't form herds in the same way that zebra or elephants do um, but they do form loose association herds not the bulls the bulls tend to live alone sometimes
Hello everybody, sorry about the lack of um What was that? Sorry about that uh, lack of uh, transmission suddenly uh, Not sure what happened like I say, possibly a piece of Russian space debris that has uh, knocked out one of the satellites. But here we are. We have now come back to Gari Dam, and we're now heading down, or to the Juma Dam, I'm never sure what it's called. And we're heading down south, but further east of where we were. Just trying to see if we can pick up some tracks. did have tracks of a female leopard going north over our boundary, so quite possibly Karula, and we're now going to see if we can't find Mbula's tracks. But I suspect what he's done is headed due straight east and um, through, through the block, um, and we'll try and pick him up around there. He won't generally hang around where there's been a kill. Once it's finished, I mean. That said, they could be the lack of tracks that I'm seeing here. Yeah, might mean that they're both in and around that area. But we didn't see anything today, and we've checked quite extensively. a huge amount going on here. So this road that we're on now goes basically bang through the center of the reserve. A little bit south and then it turns east. And so that'll give us... If he's come this way, it's quite likely he would have crossed this. Lines are always an important place to look. We're going to have a little bit of a listen here and see what we can hear. Um, Brent is tracking a, a male lion, so we're going to go across to him and see how he's doing, and I'll see you a little bit later. Morning and welcome back. Apologies for the gremlins, but uh, hopefully they're under control now. And while we've while we've been gone from you, um, we went up towards Sydney's dam and we found the tracks of a single male lion coming in from Buffalzok. We have now tracked him across the whole of Duma, and we're on the Arethusa boundary now, and he's heading south down this boundary, um, and we're going to keep following these tracks and hopefully we are able to find them. When I do get a clear track on some soft soil I will show you but at the moment it's on hard soil so I have to concentrate quite hard to see them. Short from London. 
Sean would like to know if I've heard any more updates on the Birmingham boys uh, pushing further south into the Sabi Sands and Juma. I haven't, uh, Sean. Uh, not for a couple of days. They were seen in Buffalo's Hook uh, a couple of days ago. Okay, we're back. I'm back on the tracks. And it looks like he might take this big game path here. Which he does. Okay, Andrew, can we just have a quick look so everyone can see that nice big line track in the soft sand? So... These are quite fresh tracks, so I'm not going to get out and explain about them because I would rather find the lion who's at the other end of them. So a male lion can walk an incredible distance. So we're going to shoot around to the next road uh, and see if we can find his tracks. Just excuse me a second, I need to change. Oh no. He's come back, walking down the middle of the road. He just went off for a scent mark there, I guess. So I keep looking ahead down the road. I'm looking at the track, so maybe you might even spot the line before me. I just need to get onto the Arethusa radio channel, so I'm just going to be chatting for a, a few seconds. Hopefully. Morning stations, Brent from Wild Earth. This is an update on Safari and Dow at the moment. Copy, thanks. I've got the Nkonzo of one Wanuna. Ngala, um, that come all the way from Buffalo's Hook um, and are now on Triple M, uh, close to the junction with Impala Plains. I'm still following up. Copy, thanks. Someone else is following male line tracks, but very close to the Arethusa uh, camp itself. Um, and I'm just going to try to find out whether this is the same track. Um, if it is, it's crossed south out of our traverse area. So, wow! While I wait to hear an update on that, now this is a big elephant. Um, elephant track. Should I say? Not an elephant. Try and put some nice light on it. How's that look, Andrew? Perfect. Awesome. So this is a big elephant bull. Um, while I wait for that update on those line tracks, I'm gonna show you what's going on here. All of them are good. All of them are good. <coughs> So, I mean, look at the size of this elephant track next to my hand print. That is massive. Actually, my boots probably going to be easier to see. Oh, Impala looking on. Um, look how big that is. That is one, two of my boots. And I am a UK size 12 or 13. So this is an incredibly big elephant footprint. And um, now I've got a question for you. Which way is this elephant going? Is he going south? Or is he going north? So which way do you guys think this elephant track is going? Amazing. Uh, quite fresh. But also because of the early morning, I mean, you can actually see all the little 
indentations uh, from the bottom of the pad, that spongy bottom of an elephant's foot. Really, really nice big track. Adult male. Um, over 30, but more than that, I can't really say. Sorry guys, I just thought I heard something there for a second. Mm, difficult to say. Uh, some small birds alarming, but they don't sound too excited. So, isn't that wonderful? Uh, which way is that elephant going? Let's see who can get that one right. Remember to send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safarilive on Twitter. Let's have a quick look down the road. Always pays to double check things. happening down there. Sometimes those shadows in the early morning play tricks on your eyes. Roy, Roy, do you copy? Do you know where he started uh, following those in Konzo? Ah, uh, okay, copy, thanks. I think this might be the same in Konzo. I'm gonna just uh, check not for an open quickly, um, and if it's heading towards there, if there's a mighty yeah, I'll leave there. So now, on those elephant tracks, as I said, they're fresh, but not that fresh. Uh, we've got the elephant dung here. Which one? That one. That one? Yeah. So you can see it's still moist. Uh, it's glistening in the morning sunshine. Still wet, but not warm. So, could have been a couple of hours ago. And a big bull elephant can travel an incredible distance in a couple of hours. And look at that. So, just, I've even got out of the car, and there's a female kudu who's completely ignored me while I was looking at the elephant poo. A couple of kudu there. Looks like there's a big male at the back, so I'll have a quick look at this beautiful lady before having a look at the male. Nice morning backlight. I'm just going to reverse a little bit and have a look at the, the male. Oh, just catch the sun glinting off his horns. So when Andrew, I think he might move forward into that gap in a few seconds. So maybe there. How's that? It'll work. He's going to move following the ladies. So there is a little gap coming up uh, to the right of that dark wood uh, bark of the terminalia that he's walking towards. The terminalia is the silver cluster leaf. 
And you can see that early morning light glinting off this beautiful male kudu's horns. So you can see they're browsing. Even though it looks like they might be eating grass because their heads are down, they are... <coughs> Bless you, Andrew. <coughs> Bless you, Andrew. Thank you, sir. Um, they are feeding off small uh, bushes and stuff that are probably nice and young and tasty. And there we go. Like with a lot of our sightings we see with animals moving and feeding, along comes the fork-tailed drongo, taking advantage of any insect that's disturbed by any animal. I've seen them feeding above everything from as small as a dwarf mongoose to as large as elephants. Even had them following our vehicles from time to time. Here we go. Moving into a slightly more open area. Really impressive horns on a male kudu. Now, I know I, a couple of safaris ago I spoke about trophic levels. And what I do when I refer to trophic levels, especially with browsers, it's more important. It's the different heights animals can feed at. And you can see kudu will feed at a much higher level than the other browsers, bushbuck and inyala. Uh, and that is probably why they evolved to be so big. Um, is so during the dry times or the hard times, they are able to feed at a slightly higher level uh, to minimize competition. Uh, and if it's a really, really dry year, they're able to utilize those leaves that other animals are too short to get to. And this is also probably why we find kudu in a far more varied habit than bushbuck and nyala. Bushbuck and nyala are normally more confined to your drainage lines and thickets um, where there are a lot of evergreen trees um, because during the dry season out here in the, on the top of the crests in the Combretum and Marula woodland, or the two predominant species, um, a lot of the trees will have that higher graze line or browse line, sorry, so that's how the kudu are able to um, be able to live in a far more diverse area than the other trafalegids or spiral horned antelope we get in this area. So, we will leave these kudus and continue on our merry way. So, I had, while we were chatting about the kudu, I had an update on um, those lion tracks we're following. Unfortunately, they're the same ones Roy found in, uh, on the Arethusa Dam War, and they have crossed um, south out of our out of our area. So we're going to continue on and see what else we can find. Barbara, Romay, Purple Rain, and Edward who said North. So I'm just going to show you, and there is a nice clear track again, why I said this elephant was going to the North. And it's quite interesting. I actually let a trainee ranger track an elephant backwards for about five kilometers once to teach him a lesson so he would never forget how to know which way elephant tracks are going. So I will show you in a second. Yep, that's good. So you see this very distinct scuff mark here 
Uh, it's very different from an elephant track when an elephant track is standing. Sometimes you can see the little toes on the elephant track. But while he's walking, if you watch my feet and how I walk, as I walk, my foot goes down and does that. So that's the same as that elephant's footprint is going like that as he walks towards the north. Morning, morning. Yes, that's correct. You just keep going straight to Gary Gate. Um, so as you can see, uh, this elephant is definitely heading to the north. And as you go forward, there's that little flick. And that's what we're seeing over there. Uh, and if you look at elephant tracks carefully, that's how you gauge their direction. So, elephant tracking lesson over. Uh, let's go find some more animals. Well, I don't want to walk right behind the back of the vehicle so you can't see me. So, we've got some thick bush in front of us, so I think I'm going to have to go over the bonnet. Hmm. Ah. So, guys, let's go see what else we can find. Morning, morning, morning. Okay. Well, first, my first plan is to get off this very busy access road now that there are no lion tracks to follow up on and it's very corrugated, so uh, not very pleasant. So, the first available opportunity. I will be disappearing from this road and I got a feeling that the Juma is the place to be this morning so those lion tracks have moved straight through Arethusa and out so I think I'm not going to go to Arethusa just yet I've just got a sneaky suspicion that we want to be on Juma today so while I get off this dusty corrugated road we'll go see what Commander Bond has been up to and we'll be back with you a little later in the show. Hello everybody. Welcome back to Jiga and that glorious African sun sunrise in which um, Jean-Dre and I are basking with some sense of relief as we've come out of the drainage line system and up onto the crest here where we're able to feel the glorious, gorgeous sun's rays touching our backs and our faces. It really is a magnificent feeling on a winter's morning out here in wildest Africa. We've come to Biffles Hook Dam. And here at Biffleshook Dam, we have the sad news that uh, the Bachelor of Biffleshook, a.k.a. Bob, is there on his own. We're not sure where the female or the other bull has gone, but there's some beautiful birds across the way there, one of which, the white one, is a spoonbill, which is not common in this area. Yeah, I mean, I've seen four, I saw four yesterday with, with Brian at Arethusa, uh, but... That's not a common sight here, and they've got a unique spoon-shaped bill, uh, hence their name, obviously, and they sort of search for algae mainly as they sort of spoon through the water and through the mud for that unique bill. Beautiful bird. And just behind him, some blacksmith lapwings, so named for the call that they make. They make a call that goes ding, 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 which apparently is supposed to sound like a a blacksmith's hammer smacking on his anvil, but I uh, certainly don't hear that when I hear that, hear the bird calling. And then just to the right of the spoonbill, uh, coming into frame shortly, is the white-breasted cormorant. Also, seems to be resident around this dam, but not very common in the area. had a little diker that was coming down and having a little 
uh, drink at the water, but not much else. Very nice atmosphere around here, though. There always seems to be. And we had some wonderful questions yesterday about the quality of water that people, uh, that not people, that animals are able to drink. And somebody even asked if we put chemicals in the water to, to clean it so that the animals can have a better quality of water. And the animals don't mind this sort of water at all. And the amount of buffalo dung and hippo dung and various other bits and pieces of rotting material that must be in this water would make it totally unfit for human consumption. But the animals don't seem to mind at all. Very lovely atmosphere here. Chinspot Battis is calling. You hear a woodpecker going. Way in the distance, a black headed oriole. Wagtail, fairly lovely morning scene. As I said yesterday, the dawn chorus in um, winter is far more sort of uh, chamber music than it is symphony. Very beautiful, but much more subtle than the overwhelming sounds of the summer morning. That sound that you heard was Bob exhaling and taking a deep breath as he contemplates another day of lounging in the water. Because that is what he will do. He'd have been out in the night having a bit of a, a graze on the grass around the place. But now he will be back in the water doing very little for the rest of the day. Right, well, I think we'll probably press on from here. There were some lions calling, not, uh, but they sounded like they were probably in uh, eastern Mozambique on the coast. They were so far away. So I don't think we're going to find them. Um, but we'll see what else we can come up with. I am beginning to suspect that Mvula, who was at the kill yesterday, um, is in fact still in that area. I have found no evidence of any tracks. Nobody else has found tracks. So we're going to head pretty much back in that direction and just see if we can't pick up his, his track somewhere. Um, we'll do a little loop around here. We're in the far eastern sector of the reserve and then we'll head back in that general direction and just see if we can't pick his tracks up coming out. We might be lucky. We might not. Right, on we go. <laughs> A lovely, lovely message from Claire, whose little daughter Gabby is aged seven. And yesterday, if you weren't watching, and why weren't you if you weren't, um, she gave me the challenge to uh, emulate some ox peckers that we saw having a dust bar. Um, so I took her up on the challenge and I did that and uh, challenged her to do the same. And her mother says that she's going to do that. Um, Claire, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm sure I've probably made your life quite a lot di more difficult, but let's face it, you did, you, you did exactly, you did make a bit of a, um, a fool of me on the internet, or put me up to it. So, um, I hope, I hope to see pictures of uh, Gabby having her dust bath fairly soon.
enjoy to have our younger viewers, our budding young naturalists. And if you, any of you have got uh, nieces, nephews, or, uh, sons and daughters, we'd love to hear from them. We'd love to hear their questions. Um, it's, re it's always refreshing to hear children's questions, especially around this sort of natural world. Um, and we, we hope to inspire a whole generation of new wilderness warriors, if you like, um, from this. Ooh, well spotted Jean Dre. Jean Dre has spotted a little tree squirrel on this dead leadwood tree. It's now hiding from us. We're just going to sit here and see if it doesn't pop its head out. There he is. little squirrel. That's a baby. I suspect they have a little nest in this tree. One of the holes, it's a, it's a dead leadwood tree, so it, and it's very old, so it'll have a number of sort of holes that uh, probably have been drilled out, not so much by woodpeckers, but probably by years of fungal infection. And that's where that little squirrel would have been born. That's not an adult. That's definitely a, a young, a sub-adult. Just catching exactly like Chandra and I were doing, catching the warmth of the, of the early sun. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Listening and looking, quite curious as to what we, we want. feeling quite safe where, where he or she is. <laughs> Beautiful color of the squirrel against the sky. This magnificent old leadwood tree. This wood, these trees stand for possibly hundreds of years after they die because the wood is so dense and so very, very difficult for any kind of infection to get into them and rot away the wood. So while they're long dead, they stand as monuments to the past for many, many years. And of course provide any number of homes for different creatures. And the squirrels especially love them. Isn't that very sweet? Let us continue on our way. Like I say, the, um, the seat of Jiga won't move forward this morning, and so I'm stretching at the pedals after Brent has been here. tracks on the road from where that hippo we saw in the dam came out and would have grazed around here during the course of the evening and then gone back later on. Hello Lisa, <laughs> you are living in Arizona in quite different conditions to those we are experiencing here. Apparently it's 112 degrees there, so that's 44 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's beastly, Lisa. Um, it, you want to know how hot it gets here in summer? It can get up to that temperature. Um, I'd say that's probably about the maximum we'd get, maybe once a year. So never consistently that hot. Middle of summer, it'll consistently go up to 36, 38 degrees Celsius. So probably around 102, 104 degrees Fahrenheit in the middle of summer. Yes, it gets pretty hot. But as far
As far as I know, Arizona, you're pretty much sitting in a desert, so I'm sure it gets hotter than here and then probably cools down quite substantially during the night. Around here, in the nighttime in summer, uh, you can often get temperatures of 25 degrees. So you lie in your bed sweating if you don't have air conditioning. Uh, and we don't really use air conditioning a huge amount out here. So often what we'll do is we'll, we'll take a sheet soak it in water, lie down in our beds and cover ourselves with that. And when you wake up in the morning, you're relatively refreshed and the sheet is bone dry. So that's a young male steenbok, or sorry, an adult male steenbok. And I've stopped here because we don't often see their horns so beautifully. So that's a young ram. And we had a question a little while back about whether or not there are or why some of the bigger antelopes seem to have the females have horns and the small ones the females never have horns and the general consensus is that because a steenbok's major defense is to hide rather than stand and fight predators those horns are only on the males for when they have disputes over women or over territory I really enjoy watching them because it's so nice to just be quiet for a while and hear what's happening did hear a kudu bark, which is a loud alarm call that a kudu makes long way to the east, probably not too far from uh, Gauri Waterhole, which is where we had the Hadamvula. So we're going to head around in that direction now. Um, for those of you who are perhaps new, Mvula is a the territorial male leopard of the area that we currently find ourselves and that's who we were watching last night he was on a kill he stole the kill from his erstwhile um, wife girlfriend concubine whatever she is and uh, very unchivalrous of him and she's disappeared and we're now hoping to go and find him um, some lovely questions from Astralina, a, a really clever question to which I'm not sure I know the answer. You say, and this is a really great thought, I talked about the cocktail of dung and um, there'll be fish dung and hippo dung and buffalo dung and all manner of other dung in that water there and that we were just at. And Astralina, you want to know, do I think that the cocktail of uh, bacteria and nutrients that must be in that dam perhaps doesn't help um, some of the animals, especially the herbivores? And I'd say that's probably quite a good thought. It may, may well. Um, certainly, animals like hippo will select, uh, not hippo, uh, elephant, will select for warm, for if they can get it they won't drink that scaffy stuff but they will if they have to um, it's an interesting thought there may well be some form of uh, bacteria in there that is helpful to them uh, to line their digestive tracts especially as a lot of that bacteria would come from the dung 
um, that I mean from the from the dung of the same sort of animals from the same species. Brilliant idea, brilliant question. And then we had a, a comment last night. We saw uh, old Bob there, and his uh, he's a. Uh, he had a friend with him, and we've seen her around a few times. Um, I'm assuming she's a cow, but she might not be. It might be a, a young bull. And I asked for the Twitterverse to provide a name for Bob's new companion. And George Ann reckons Bobette. Now we've had a few answers to the to the uh, to the naming question. I think the jury's still out as to what we should call her. So I'm going to let it continue for a little while before we settle on the name. seriousness though I don't think that that area is going to support a great number of hippos so when the mob gets big enough and strong enough I suspect he'll wander down towards the sand river and try and take a territory but I might be wrong he might stay there for a while On the far eastern boundary, we're going to go across to Brent while we head down this road. Um, he's got some interesting antelope to show you, so ask him lots of questions and we'll see you just now. Welcome back everyone, um, we're now down on the eastern boundary and we've come across a little group of animals here to the right. We've got a lone wildebeest bull who's hanging out with some female waterbuck. Oh. Guys, we've got some alarm calls just I'm just gonna try to work out where they are sounds like a kudu here we go okay it sounds like they're just down to here and um, they're very, very close you hear that loud bark of a kudu um, we'll go check there if we can't find anything we'll definitely come back to this wildebeest and waterback group um, but we are very close to those alarm calls, so it's definitely worth shooting down there. You never know what we might find. Um, any guesses, Andrew? What it could be alarming us? I'm going to go for leopard. You're going to go for leopard. I think that's a wise, wise choice. It gratefully sounds like it's right next to the road. And for once, we're not chasing alarm calls from a mile away, we're chasing them from close by, which always makes it uh, a better, better odds. Could have guessed right around here. alarm calls it's always first prize to spot the animal that's doing the alarm calling and then follow their eye line so we're just gonna sit and listen very quietly for a second Thank you. 
Kuan Kudus Park again, just once more. Hornbills bubbling away. Okay, well, they have an alarm called again. I think we're going to move very slowly down this road. I'm going to try to see if I can find any tracks on it. Alarm call sounds like a big dog bark. This is going to go very slowly. Let's see if I can see any tracks. very slowly, not only am I looking for tracks, I'm also looking for the kudu, and that'll give me a much better idea about where to check carefully. So, out of a lot of the animals, kudu are probably one of the most reliable when they're alarm call. Um, and pilots sometimes get a fright and alarm call at strange things. I've seen them alarm call at hyena. I've seen them alarm call at jackal. Um, but when a kudu alarm calls you, quite confident that there's a uh, one of the the cats or a wild dog or something that is definitely worth following up on around. My gut feeling is it was more in this direction, in this thick block here. I'm going to just check a little bit further down, and then we're going to go up and around and check the next road that runs at the top end of this block. I'm just going to check to this corner where there's a, a prominent game pass. Here we go. Um, we have a nice, very fresh set of 
male leopard tracks here. It's on a very difficult ground, so unfortunately I can't show it to you. If I do see a clear track in soft soil, I will um, show you. Okay. There's an impala right there. So that's... Not a good sign. I'm going to try to have a better look, see if I can age these tracks a bit better. As soon as I get a, a better track on softer soil. I've got a feeling these tracks look a little bit old. Softer soil on this corner. And Murphy's Law, no tracks there. I got a feeling these tracks are a little bit old and the kudu were alarming further to our east. There's a kudu, I just saw it there. I don't think this was as far, and if the kudu had been alarming, these particular kudu, these impala would have been alarming as well. Sorry, I just thought I heard another. Alarm call. Let's head back up to the crest. Um, back up to the top. Um, I'm pretty sure that alarm calling was higher up. So I'm going to check along on Drakensberg Road that runs parallel. But a good sign that there's leopard tracks looks like from yesterday sometime. Um, looks like a young male leopard. Unfortunately hard ground so I'm not able to show you a nice track. But we're going to keep working this area for a little bit longer uh, and see if we come up with uh, any more fresh sign or even better, hopefully, the animal. you 
who are late might be new viewers. My name is Brent and we're on a live African safari and welcome on the back of my vehicle and we're also interactive so you're able to ask us questions about what we're doing in the bush uh, and what we're seeing and you can do that by emailing us and the email address is questions at wildearth.tv or you can use the hashtag safari live if you belong to the Twitter sphere. Edward. Edward would like to know whether I've ever seen a leopard raiding a bird's nest in a tree. Uh, Edward, I personally haven't, but I know um, some people who have, and they have been recorded doing it quite a, quite a few times. But that is definitely something I would absolutely love to see one day. This is the area yeah, I think those alarm calls were coming from. Also, those, the Kuru and Impala we saw lower down looked far too relaxed to have just seen a predator. Brenda from Virginia. Brenda would like to know whether the sticks lion cubs have been seen this week or are they within our Travis area? Unfortunately not Brenda, they are quite a long way to the east of us at the moment uh, and you probably find that with the Nkahumas coming into this area quite a bit this week and um, that the females would have moved them even further away for their own safety. But I have heard from the other vehicles that they have been spotted um, down towards the Kruger National Park boundary. So quite a distance from us at the moment. Stop for a few seconds and listen again. So I know I harp on about it a little, but quite often your ears are going to help you find an animal faster than your eyes. Um, and that's learning how to read um, the different noises in the bush from the alarm calls and sometimes you can even find a leopard from the tiniest little bird's alarm call. Unfortunately at the moment it is very quiet. But quite an interesting little thing Andrew you can see the gap between this closest quarry bush uh, and the buffalo thorn. If you zoom through there you can see the opposite sort of crest um, on Juma and you notice you can notice there's some very dark looking trees there 
where there's the rest of the bush is quite quite grey at this time of the year and you can actually spot the torchwood trees sticking out with that dark green. Isn't that incredible? Well, not all the dark green, those ones to the top right, not torchwoods. Oh, I need binoculars to see what they are. There is a the lighter green is a, a rain tree, and there is a marula there that's still got a bit of green, but that dark green that sticks out most and higher up, sort of from the middle of that horizon, are, are big torchwood trees. And if I ever say I was in, if I ever got lost yeah, um, or was in an area of the bush, I didn't know um, at this time of the year um, from high ground or from climbing a tree those are the type of things you would use to navigate and also if I was looking for water and I was sitting up here and I could definitely see there's a depression if I climbed a tree between us and I would be hoping for a sandy riverbed um, like is there and I would have to join the elephants in digging in that sand uh, to try and find water. Also, uh, if I was really smart, I would try and find an area that elephants had already excavated and they've done half the work for me. And uh, in my years, I have drunk a few times out of uh, elephant excavations and sandy riverbeds, uh, mostly in southern Tanzania, while out on anti-poaching patrols. Lisa, uh, welcome on this beautiful sunrise safari. Um, Lisa would like to know what makes all those splashes uh, in the Juma pond uh, during the night that you can hear on the Juma camp. Uh, Lisa would like to know whether it's catfish. It is most certainly almost catfish. Sometimes you might get some nocturnal pushing by a heron and whatnot, but the majority of those noises will all be catfish. I'm just going to do one last loop around this area, see if we find... What was that? What track was that? Um, check very carefully here yeah? and I'm afraid it's Howard the hyena again and um, Howard is a nickname I have for all hyenas whether they be male or female um, so and it comes from that film shoot I did uh, uh, with Kevin Richardson uh, a while ago 
um, when we were doing cognition studies with lions and hyenas and uh, we took one of my photographs and made a life-size hyena in two dimensions to test whether hyenas uh, how they, they, their sight works um, and whether they react to two dimensions same as three dimensions whether they can recognize the spots on familiar animals versus unfamiliar animals uh, turned out the hyenas were far too smart and did not attack the cardboard cutout like the lions did and so after we finished filming I got to take Howard home with me and Howard lives in my my home when I'm not at Juma and the nickname for our house is the hyena den because Howard the hyena resides there. Generally when everyone who comes to visit needs to have a picture with Howard um, if they come and spend a few nights visiting us in the bush. tracks apart from the slightly old tracks down that we saw a little bit earlier so we're going to check this big junction just to confuse me more uh, they are from yesterday before I get overexcited. And so they have been driven over. But there are lion tracks here. And these are some of the lion tracks I followed yesterday. Oh! Hello, old men. Right up on the crest. Particularly cold last night. So the buffalo would have moved away from the water holes. And drainage lines. And come up onto the crest where it's a bit warmer. So we've got a nice group of buffalo bulls, it looks like. So we're just going to have a quick look at these buffalo. Quite a few of them. Very big group of buffalo bulls. All grazing up here on the crest where it's a bit warmer. Okay. Hello old boys and actually uh, one young boy as well. And sometimes when breeding herds pass close to these groups of buffalo bulls uh, and occasionally a young male will abandon the, uh, the bachelor life um, and join with one of these herds of bulls till he feels he's old enough to challenge for a position in the herd and it's that one just there to the left slightly there we go that's the guy when I first spotted him I got slightly excited I thought oh is there possibly a herd around here but it's just a young bull with all the old men So I'm quite sure these guys are going to start moving now towards uh, the closest water point and they can spend a nice leisurely day basking in the mud. So we'll leave, oh, let's have a look what's that there. And you might see a lot of scratches on the back of that buffalo there. Oh hello Oxbecker, nice camera work Andrew. Um, those scratches are not what you might think they're not from a lion or 
anything like that. They're just from moving through the thick bush. So we're going to continue on. I'm going to go back into that area we, we heard those alarm calls and maybe have a quick look on foot to see if I can find any tracks in the drainage line. So in the meantime, uh, we're going to cross across to James, uh, see what he has been up to. I'm pretty sure he's got something quite entertaining uh, for you. And maybe you guys should convince him he needs to climb down a hole. Um, so until a little bit later in the show, uh, over to James and we'll be with you a little later. Hello everybody, welcome back to Jiga. Well, I'm not actually on Jiga anymore. We came to the hyena den to try and see if we could find some of the cubs. Um, we've seen three cubs here quite recently, but nothing at the moment. Um, and apparently we had a request from a, a three-year-old viewer who now, because of our show, wants to have a hyena as a pet. So we've come to look at the hole in which they live. Now, I've never been this close to a hyena den before, so I'm quite interested to see what, A, what it's going to look like, and B, what it's going to smell like. So, as Jean Dre zooms in inside, I'm going to smell, because I suspect there's probably quite an evil odor coming from it. Actually, totally odorless. It's remarkable. There are bits and pieces of bone in there, and it's said that wild dogs will move their dens uh, extensively because of the smell that uh, that starts to build in them from all of the uh, bacteria and the bits and pieces. They can get diseases and all sorts of parasites. But there's absolutely no smell to that at all. And the interesting thing there is that a lot of people have asked over the last few days and, and weeks uh, about the smell of predators. Every time we see a lion, somebody asks a question about, can you smell them or don't the, pre don't the uh, antelope of the area smell them? And I think these predators, especially the apex ones and the non-dog predators, remember a hyena is far more closely related to a cat than it is to a dog. I think the cat predators have a very um, uh, highly evolved um, physiology that possibly uh, negates the sm a, a distinct smell. So if you think of, let's think of domestic animals, if you think of your domestic dog and what it smells like after, it, it's especially the long-haired dogs after they've been running in a river or something like that, they really start to get a distinct smell, much like the wild dogs do. But your house cat... You can put your nose right to your house cat if it's clean. And they don't, unless they're diseased, they don't tend to smell very strongly at all. And I suspect that the cats out here are the same, and possibly the hyenas as well. There's no smell at all from that. And, one, and a hyena, after it's been eating some dirty stuff, can smell pretty rank. And they've also got very powerfully, powerful smelling anal glands. And there's no hint of that in this den so it's really quite interesting anyway that is the hyena den i'm sorry for the lack of hyenas uh, but these things cannot be predicted we're going to carry on on our way back towards the area where mvula was seen last night and just see if we can't pick up on some tracks nobody seems to have picked up on his tracks at all today which is starting to make me think he's probably still in and around that area. There's definitely nothing in the tree. We did look, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, he stole a kill from Karula last night in the top of a jackalberry tree. Uh, the inimitable Jean Dre, who's currently filming my face, poor fellow, um, managed to catch some incredible footage of him leaping up the tree and stealing the kill. And there's an incredible shot of Karula actually jumping over Mvula on her way down the tree, meters from the vehicle, and then disappearing off. But he doesn't, so there's nothing left in the tree of the kill, which was a small bushbuck, um, and I haven't seen any tracks of him. So he may well still be in and around there. 
so that's where we're going to go and have a look. So this is the hyena den. And those, I heard something very interesting from a very experienced guide last night. Uh, he spent some time with a hyena uh, expert. And apparently what happens is a hyena's skull only fuses completely when it's two years old. So it can only ever manage to in, put that incredible biting force down when the skull is fused. Because if the skull is not fused, um, what ha would happen, of course, if they use those muscles, the skull would stretch apart. Uh, which is not ideal when it encases your brain, uh, even if you are a hyena. And so the cubs will stay with the mothers until they're at least two years old, which is quite interesting. That's long. That's very long for a predator. And they'll, if the females will stay within the clan, uh, but they will be dependent for, on their mothers and on other clan members for food until they're about two years old, which is quite interesting. Right. I don't think they'll need the den, though, and I think they're going to spend less and less time at the den and more and more time foraging with the adults from now on. Okay, here we go. young naturalist is age three is her name is Ella and her mum Elizabeth has written to us to tell us that she used to want a rabbit for a pet but now she tells everybody she wants a rabbit and a hyena well the good news on that front Elizabeth for you as the parent is that uh, a hyena clearly doesn't smell too bad we know that so uh, if were you to have one in your Minneapolis home you could be relatively pleased as long as they didn't start scent marking with their anal glands that your home would be uh, free of nasty smells. Uh, I'm not sure how the other animals would react when you took your hyena down the road uh, on, on its leash um, and I'm not sure um, you know how your fridge would survive the machinations of a hyena's jaws. So if I might suggest it, um, perhaps not the best pet for little Ella. Um, perhaps a, 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 a fluffy toy in the shape of hy a hyena would be, would be better. A spotted hyena will grow up to 70 kilograms, uh, which is enormous. sort of back into the area where Mbula was seen and hoping that he may have crossed a road somewhere but everybody there's been a lot of activity around this area throughout the day and there's been very little no no reports of any tracks sometimes they can be missed especially on the harder roads but I think he's still around there You can see that the temperature has most definitely warmed up slightly. Uh, Jandre is looking far less uh, uncomfortable. He's starting to smile a bit for the first time during the day. And I've taken my scarf off. And the Scots, Scots ridiculous mittens as well. Oh, that's beautiful. Try that roller there. Beautiful shot of a roller. Please don't move, Mr. Roller. There we go, the gorgeous lilac breasted roller. I'm still looking for uh, two feathers for two of our Hawaiian viewers who've promised me some spectacular coffee if I manage to find them each a feather from um, a lilac breasted roller. I have found them in the past, but since this has happened, since the, the offer of the coffee has been made, I've yet to see one. And short of taking a pellet gun to one of these beautiful animals, I'm not sure how I'm going to get one. 
And the, the former is obviously not an option. Beautiful bird. Mm. Just flipped off there. Almost like a little shrike. They've got a little tooth on the front of the beak and they use that to pin insects on the ground and then they'll fly up and devour them from where they sit. So they're not hawkers like um, a drongo or a swallow or a swift which take insects in the air. They'll fly down from the perch and grab something out of the grass. Difficult time the winter for all. I think just about every creature except the predators perhaps. Um, because if you're an insect eater, there's not much in the way of insects. If you are a grass eater, the grass is brown and fairly barren. If you're a browser, eventually all the leaves are going to, or most of the trees are going to lose their leaves, and those that don't tend to be fairly chemically, uh, chemically pr protected by all sorts of things that make them unpalatable or poisonous. It's not an easy time winter for anything out here, uh, even for us. ask a lovely question um, to which we could probably have three days worth of discussion um, you want to know you just following on from the discussion of the heat of the day and the heat of uh, you know maximum temperatures and you say well dogs pant but how do the big cats lose heat and how do the antelope lose heat the big cats do tend to pant a bit I think they lose some heat that way they do lie a lot in the shade as you say and they move around during um, the night when it's not so hot. So they are really, they sort of try and avoid the heat that way. But in the Kalahari, they will sometimes move during the day. And in Botswana, where it's extremely hot, um, they'll do that. They will sometimes even swim. Um, but the antelope and how they lose heat, to me, is the, the most amazing. Yeah, they, they, they do the traditional things, if you like to call them that, where they drink and they... Um, stand in the shade, but a lot of them, especially the ones that can cope with big heat, so say a uh, Hemsbok, which we don't get out here, um, or Oryx, which we get in Namibia and the Kalahari, and on the Highfield and the Springbok, they've evolved incredible ways of uh, maintaining body heat and allowing bits and pieces of their bodies to, to get hotter. So a Hemsbok, for example, or Oryx, um, is a, a large sort of a uh, very rapier horned antelope that occurs in desert regions and they've evolved the ability to cool the brain while allowing the rest of the body to go up to about 40 degrees centigrade. Now if you have a temperature of 40 degrees centigrade, so that's roughly what, 108 degrees Fahrenheit, if you've got a temperature like that you're in serious trouble. Um, around the Chemspork or Oryx is able to allow the body temperature to go up to 40 degrees while cooling the brain through an incredible, incredibly sophisticated network of, of veins and arteries in the nasal cavity such that, I mean, the simple way of describing it is that when they breathe in, the air, the blood that's about to go to the brain uh, cools down through what we call the carotid reti um, uh, sort of network of, of veins and then basically it cools the brain and then goes to, goes to the rest of the body and in so doing it can keep the brain at a perfect temperature uh, while the rest of the body it allows to get hotter. Things like springbok um, are amazingly colored so that they reflect, you know the ground is often very hot so they're white underneath which reflects away that heat comes off the ground. They've got brown flanks which are not exposed 
to the heat, to the direct sun, and so they radiate out heat. And they'll also orientate themselves to the sun in such a way that, so the sun, as you can see, is dead straight in front of us now. If I was a springbok in the middle of the desert, I'd turn my back to the sun, orientate away, and I've got white on the back that reflects the sun. So they're all, they're incredible adaptations to uh, living with, with heat and heat stress and a lack of water in all the antelope. And to a greater or lesser extent, the antelope out here, where it does get very hot, but not quite as hot as it does in the desert, um, will have some of those adaptations. But remember, what animals do have here is water. Okay. Right, we're going to go across the Brent, and we're going to just check this area now for it's from Vula Tracks, and we'll see you a little bit later. Well, um, we have a forktail drongo there. Welcome back, everyone. And oh no, sorry, I'm so incorrect. The forktail drongo is behind. It's a long-tailed shrike above the buffalo, but he is doing the same thing. Uh, that a forktail drongo is doing. He's waiting for insects disturbed by this big uh, group of buffalo bulls and then he is pouncing. Um, we went and had another quick look around and been listening to see if we could hear any more alarm calls and we didn't. So we decided to come back to this nice big group of buffalo. Um, if we go off to the left there, oh, there we go, perfect Andrew. Um, I think I've seen this buffalo before at Twin Dams and the oxpeckers keep, keep that wound open and you can see the oxpeckers are waiting patiently for the buffalo. Um, he's been swiping at them every time they go near that wound. So there we go. Um, oxpeckers, although they do help a lot of the animals by removing um, parasites, also when they have a wound, oxpeckers can be incredibly frustrating um, for any animal because they will also happily eat blood uh, and they congeal blood so they will, can keep a wound on an animal open for quite a long time. I'm going to try to see if we can sneak a little closer to both the long-tailed shrike and the buffalo who's got a sore bottom. Lisa on Twitter, uh, Lisa would like to know, do the bachelors ever chase the young bull away and not let them join the group? Not normally Lisa, um, there will be a, always a little bit of competition in these buffalo bull groups, nothing too serious though like the breeding herds, um, they're sort of past their prime, they're not really too worried about mating and stuff like that. And so they don't really take too much notice but the oxpeckers shame are giving that old man a hard time and he's trying to keep them off uh, that wound and in so he's getting a little bit uppity with some of the other buffalo and I think that's just pure frustration with the oxpeckers you can see he's constantly jumping uh, and to try to keep those oxpeckers off his back If we have a look just to our right, there's a buffalo lying very close to us. So they're still waiting for it to warm up before they move towards um, the drainage lines and, and water holes. So he's just sitting, not even chewing the cud just chewing a little bit there it seems more just enjoying the warmth of the morning sun now if we were walking on foot um, obviously sometimes buffalo bulls are one of the things you don't really want to walk into um, from too close a range and um, we would be listening for the chirps of the oxpecker and if you go a little bit to the right on this pool closest to us oh he's turned his head there we go we can see that is a juvenile ox, a red bull oxpecker. Hasn't got the red bull yet. 
And you can see how he's using that combed beak of his to go through the, the fur and try to pick up those ticks. You can actually hear all the noises that if we're on foot that would let us uh, know that that there there were buffalo in the area. The oxpeckers chirping would probably be the biggest giveaway. Um, but also just that constant sort of shuffling and in the, in the grass and um, the rubbing of branches. Sometimes it can sound quite similar uh, to an elephant, but it's you don't have that distinct breaking of branches. It's all the moving around of branches, and that's buffalo sort of scratching behind their ears and rubbing their horns. So, very important to know how to listen to these different signs that the bush gives us. And we can see an ox pecker cleaning out ticks from the nostrils and around the eyes. But I think it's going to be a little while before these guys get moving, so we're going to go carry on and see what else we can find. Goodbye, old men. Watch out for the lions. One of the reasons they form these bachelor groups um, is as a deterrent to lions. So a group of old boys like this is obviously a far more formidable uh, thing for a lion to attack than say a single buffalo bull by itself. I'm just to be on the game drive radio for a second. James, James. chat to James, see what areas he's been working, so we try not to cover the same ground twice in the morning. Strangely enough, the only Elephant tracks we've seen this morning are of that big bull uh, and nothing else. The elephants seem to have vacated for the last little bit, um, from Juma at least. I know there were some on Arethusa yesterday. Welcome back everyone. Unfortunately it seems to be the gremlins are playing new tricks on us at the moment and uh, are putting a, 
a lag in. So even though I might have left the buffalo a few minutes ago, you were seeing a little bit late. So hopefully it's, it's fixed now. So we really do apologize for that. And our tech wizards are trying to zap gremlins with their wands as we speak. Um, so to let you know, after the buffalo, we've meandered down here. Uh, and while with that, we've got a very interesting question about bears. Um, and bears in Africa, uh, are there any that occur naturally? And um, if there aren't, what would happen if they were introduced? And would they survive? Uh, and it's, it's, it's sparked quite a bit of debate between Andrew and myself, at least. And it, we decided it, it depends completely on the bear. Like sloth bears from Asia and that might have a, uh, an effect on your hyena and leopard populations because they'd be competing there. Um, but whether the climate's too dry for them is also another possibility. Um, but with grizzly bears and that, um, they might start competing with, with lions. And the one thing that worries me about grizzlies um, is the heat. Would they be able to deal with this constant heat? They wouldn't have that hibernation period. And you don't have some of those really rich food sources that grizzlies are really dependent on, like the salmon runs and things like that. So they might have to hunt a lot more, would put them directly into competition with lions and hyenas. And it'd be quite interesting, and this is all speculation, of course, and hypothesizing, is that if they were to survive from a climate point of view, would you notice a change in sort of lion pride dynamics? Would they get bigger to compete? Um, the hyena clans as well. And I've got a feeling they would. Um, and the bears would also have to, because the bears mainly would do scavenging, I guess, from the other predators and would definitely affect the other predators. But a very interesting question and not something I'd ever thought about before. But obviously, um, all in theory, at the, uh, in, all in theory, of course. But, and that question was from Jessica in Las Vegas. So thanks very much for that, Jessica. We're now going to meander down towards the drainage line. I've come back to do one last loop in this area um, where we heard those uh, alarm calls earlier this morning. And I'm just hoping we maybe find some sign of a leopard. would like to know, is it a possibility that the buffalo might lose his tail from those ox peckers keeping on harassing uh, and keeping that wound open? There is a possibility, definitely, um, with infection, um, but probably not from them pecking. They are after more the congealed blood uh, and they open up the scab. They don't really dig out the wound too much, although they can on occasion. And um, then we have another question from Ginny who would like to know, uh, can we get Lyme disease from the ticks that are on buffalo? Uh, Ginny, we do not get Lyme disease here in, in Africa, but we, we get what we call tick bite fever or rickettsia is its proper Latin name. I'm not 100% sure it could be related to Lyme disease. There are quite a lot of rickettsias um, uh, out there. Uh, and sort of swells up your gland, makes you feel quite nauseous and ill, depending on the, on the, on the rickettsia we get in this area. But generally, if you get that uh, tick bite fever in this area and you don't take any medication for it and you let your body fight it through, uh, you'll be immune uh, to this, that strain. But there are so many different strains. Um, after I left the rainforest, I was very ill for a couple of months. No one could work out what was wrong with me. So the problem with the blood tests for rickettsia is that uh, a lot of them uh, are only successful about 30% of the time. Unfortunately, I've got a, v a very, very good friend who's a, a doctor and specialized in sort of bush medicine. Um, and we went through, I think I went through like 32 different blood tests. They thought I had sleeping sickness, then they thought I had dengue, and then they thought I had a rare form of malaria, and it just carried on and carried on. Basically, I wasn't very physically ill during this time. I just had zero energy. And for me, that's quite unusual. Uh, so my mother in particular was quite worried because I was sleeping sort of 15, 16, 17 hours a day. And even to sort of move from 
the couch to go get something to eat was a really big effort for me. Um, and fortunately, Simon eventually uh, worked out what it was and dosed me up with a course of doxycycline and I was right as rain in three days. So for me, I just really, really had no energy and, and, and couldn't move. But And again, the different types of rickets here have slightly different system, uh, symptoms. And the one I had was a elephant-born rickettsia, so endemic, apparently to ticks that live on forest elephants in Central Africa, which was a, a new one for me, and I've had a, a few funny diseases, but that was definitely a new one. Shanae, um, Shanae just mentioned that I, yesterday I spoke about the symbiotic relationship between a yellow-billed and red-billed hornbills and dwarf mongoose. Um, and she said she's found out that there's a symbiotic relationship between rough-scaled plated lizards. And we will show you what a rough-scaled plated lizard looks like now. Um, and they also have a symbiotic relationship with dwarf mongoose and Sinead, I actually don't know too much about that I know they utilize the same burrows from time but I'm not sure what type of symbiotic uh, relationship they have where it's mutualism commensalism or parasitism but I'll find out very quickly um, if I had to guess I would say the dwarf mongoose um, oh I see it's a difficult one to guess but um, I would think maybe it's something to do with parasites. Maybe one eats the other's parasites and vice versa. But let me see if I can find anything um, in my book. Plated lizards. Plated, plated lizards. And... Worm lizards? No, we don't want worm lizards. So, Sinead, that's a really interesting question. We do love questions that actually sort of make us have to think and, and guess guess a little bit because it does obviously help us increase our knowledge and test our skills. Okay, lizard plated. Rough scaled. Okay, so got that's a giant one. Here we go. So plated lizards, then we just There's a quick view of um, the rough scaled plated lizard, which is what uh, Shanae is referring to. Okay, we're just going to pop over to its page. So unfortunately, with this book, which is a bit of a general book, um, 
doesn't seem like we have a full page for the rough scaled plated lizard. Um, so, Shanae, I'm not, I'm not very sure. So, if anyone could send me more information on that relationship between dwarf mongoose and plated lizards, I'd really appreciate it. And you can uh, send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. But I'm definitely, uh, when I get home, we'll go also have a, a look uh, and see what else I can find. Um, maybe I can find a more detailed reptile book. Sinead, thanks very much. From her research it says um, that the lizard eats the mongoose is done, um, but she's not sure whether the mongoose um, gains anything from this. Well, Sinead, I would say most definitely um, because uh, now the mongoose has a sort of rubbish man who will take away the feces and stuff, and obviously feces uh, in large proportions and, and, a, and a social animal like a dwarf mongoose could obviously cause uh, vectors for disease and stuff like that. So I would definitely say mutualism. The, the lizard removes the dung um, which does the sort of rubbish clearing in the inside of a den. Uh, and I presume that a lot of that feeding would, of the lizard will happen inside these termite mounds uh, and around the termite mounds where there's going to be a lot of defecation by all the the mongoose. But and that, and that lizard would probably be quite sedimentary. It would stay around a den site um, that the mongooses use regularly. And so it wouldn't really affect their, their, their middens for marking their territory because that would be away from the den. So um, obviously it's speculation, but I would guess there where, is where that comes in, is that the, 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 the lizards are acting as the trash man, so to speak, for the mongoose and removing all the, the poo. So actually the sewage operation, the sewage works. You guys, I'm about to cross into um, a drainage line. Sometimes we do have a little trouble uh, with our signal down here, so do bear with me and I'll try to be through it as quick as possible. Out of the drainage. Um, Andrew, I know you love these. Let's see if he turns in towards us. Oh, disappearing. I was hoping that. Oh, he's still got him. Nice camera, Andrew. Let's see if we can pick him up on the other side. There he comes. Oh, change direction. Now that was a very glimpse, a very short glimpse and a very tricky ID. But I think you guys are up to it. Um, I know that wasn't the best view of that bird we've ever had. But let's see um, who can guess what bird that was. And you can send your answers to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag. Live. Hello, everybody. 
Um, you find me standing here in the middle of Gauri Dam uh, for various reasons. First of all, we came into this area to see if we couldn't find any sign of Mvula or his tracks. We've driven the place flat, we've looked at every road for tracks and we found nothing. So I really couldn't begin to tell you where he's gone, save to say maybe he came over the dam wall and the dam wall is so hard that we wouldn't have picked his tracks up and maybe he's headed south through the drainage line. We've had lots of questions today about the heat stress in uh, animals and water and the amount of water that is uh, disappearing. Now, if you look around me, you can see that this water hole is starting to dry. And in a couple of months from now, so, well, let's take it the end of the dry season, say October, I suspect it will be a small puddle rather than a fairly extensive water hole now. And that will definitely create stress for the animals. As the water concentrates, so the animals will concentrate. And it's a great time of the year for predators because they know that animals have to drink, that the herbivores have to come down and drink. And so they tend to start to concentrate around the water holes. Not a great time if you happen to eat vegetation. Very good time if you don't. Now, I have decided to walk into this water. I wouldn't do this in summer because there'd be a lot more water and so the chances of there being a crocodile lurking around are much higher. I'm pretty sure there isn't one here now, I hope desperately. But I wanted to come and feel the mud in between my, my toes. And it really is a wonderful feeling, I have to tell you. Um, I'm walking through this magnificent grey mud. Um, it, it's slightly smelly and um, for those of you who managed to see my uh, dust bath yesterday, I don't think I'm going to be doing what the buffalo do here, but we talked a lot about heat stress earlier and this kind of mud is ideal for buffalo. They like to cover it in, cover their bodies in it, it gives them a protective sheath from the ectoparasites and it also, uh, rhino do the same thing, and it's also extremely cooling as I stand here. It's quite deep too. I'm in danger of falling over and I hope that I don't. Anyway, that's the story of water. And the story of water out here is obviously crucial given that it's semi-arid and water holes like this become more and more important as the dry season progresses. I'll just get you a handful of this magnificent stuff. I mean, look at that. That is the, that is the most beautiful mud you can imagine. There must be all sorts of good things in there from the buffalo, from the fish, from the birds. I mean any any spa treatment you had would have uh, paled in significance with the skin benefits that something like this could give you no doubt. I'm not going to put it on my face this morning though and to wash my hands and then we'll press on and see what else we can see. There are some wildebeest just wandering down. Uh, they've stopped short of the water hole because they're obviously a bit shattered by what they've seen of me climbing about in the water. The, the clay here, when it goes hard um, or when it dries, is extremely hard. And that's, that's the only reason that a water hole like this is able to maintain um, any kind of any kind of water because the clay holds the water um, and the smell of the mud is actually pretty clean you'd expect it to smell like dung and fish but it smells pretty clean um, I'll clean my feet later I won't subject you to having to watch that we'll press on and see if we can't find one or two things Remove my shoes out of the way and off we go. I must say that's a, it's a wonderful feeling of the, the earth squeezing between your toes.
from Jules. Um, you want to know what happens to the catfish and the terrapins when the water dries up. The catfish and terrapins, especially the terrapins, go into a state called estivation and what that means is that in a time of water stress what they'll do is go into um, the mud just like that mud there and they'll shut almost shut down and uh, they'll stay there in the mud hidden from predators until the water comes back and then they'll emerge now some catfish are able to do that as well, for, not for nearly as long, but they can do something fairly similar. Um, otherwise the catfish will, will often be eaten and then they'll, they'll re, uh, sort of recolonize the water hole like this when it fills up again. Because apparently their eggs will last a long time in the mud um, and they'll also be transferred here on the feet and in the feces of birds. But it is definitely not a nice time if you happen to be a catfish or any kind of fish. I say that mud doesn't smell too bad, uh, but the, the, the odor coming out of the footwell of this Land Rover is actually quite bad now. And I'm sorry you lost, apparently you lost Brent's signal. Uh, sorry about that. But he is back. Hello Safari and Donna, you're quite worried that I may have picked up a leech or a hookworm or two from that water. Uh, leeches, no, we don't really get in this area. Hookworm, I'm not too sure about. Um, I don't think so. I have been in many of those water holes before. Uh, so far I seem to be okay. Uh, my mental state might have suffered, but I haven't noticed it, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> 